Welcome to The Longest War. I'm Albert Lewington reporting. Let me go into detail on this, the longest war that history has seen, generations, centuries, a war of religion uh, between uh, in an area that is uh, prone to conflict throughout the decades, throughout the centuries. So let me bring you up to speed right now on the war in, in Gaza. Now, we're at, uh, as we take this, this is now day 160 of a war that began on October the 7th when Hamas militants broke through the barriers of uh, Gaza into southern Israel, uh, killing, raping, murdering, pillaging uh, the communities in the area around Gaza. 1,200 Israeli citizens were killed at the time. 200 were taken hostage, brought back into Gaza. Uh, about three months, two months after that incident occurred on October the 7th, about 100 were released. Right now, as we stand at day 160, there are 134 hostages, babies, children, women, uh, elderly Holocaust survivors, uh, men of fighting age, elderly men, all being held hostage by Hamas. There has been no indication as to their how they are. Uh, there are some videos that Hamas has put out uh, stating what they are in their medical conditions uh, and the, the proof of life videos. In the other side, there have been at least 30,000 Palestinians in Gaza who have been killed by action. Uh, this is now numbers that were given out by Hamas's Ministry of Health. Our viewers should know that the Ministry of Health in Gaza does not separate combatants from civilians. So the number 30,000 or 31,000 at the time of this taping uh, is a mixture of civilians and combatants. Uh, there is a lot to go through in the past week that's happened. There, there has been a pressure by the American administration to create what's known as a red line in Rafah. Rafah is the, the southernmost community of Gaza on the border with Egypt. And it's there that Israeli forces have been targeting their... their uh, right now their military action in two places it's rafa and also a city called khan yunis which is about a 20 minute drive north of there uh it, it is now if our viewers can understand the idea of the gaza strip the gaza strip is about 130 kilometers uh in in square kilometers uh this is about the one fourth the size of new york city um and what has happened is that the israeli military from the beginning from the middle of uh the end of october early november came in from the north of Gaza and then moved down slowly, slowly, slowly to get to the area that's known as Rafa right on the edge. It's there. They they suspect that most of the uh, the Hamas military leadership has moved to, as well as the, the hostages, the Israeli hostages that have been there. So what has happened in the past few weeks, there have been some directed strikes at Rafa. This is also where the humanitarian aid crosses in from Egypt, one of the areas that crosses in from Egypt. You should know that Egypt at the same time has also fortified its walls uh, to prevent Palestinians from crossing over into Egyptian territory. We'll, we'll talk to you about that in just a moment. Just a moment, actually. I'll be speaking with Doron Avital. Doron is a former special forces commander for the IDF. He's also a former minister of, of the Knesset, uh, a member of the Knesset. And he also served in Lebanon. And we'll talk to him about the theaters. There are seven theaters here in this war. It's not just a simple war between one side versus the other. There's seven conflict theaters. You've got Gaza, you've got Lebanon, you've got the West Bank, you have the Houthis in Sudan, you've got Iraq and Iran, and you have Syria. Yeah, so these seven theaters, uh, as well as, the, you know, this is something that's unheard of in history. Uh, and we'll talk to him about how the IDF deals with that in terms of strategy and in terms of, of uh, uh, tactics. Uh, he served in Lebanon, and he could tell us a little bit more about what they will face in Lebanon and why this skirmish back and forth between Israel and Lebanon is also important. Uh, we're, we're going to hope to do in this next few few episodes of this series is give you in detail past the five minute sound bites, the, the, the quick MSNBC, CNN, cable news uh, idea of, of, of news and to give you really in-depth, to go in-depth into what's happening in this war, the longest war. And we call it the longest war. Uh, just a bit of history in terms of that is that this war did not begin on October the 7th. This war began hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, and has, what has happened here, and we're at the nexus of this history, uh, is that there are two parts to this. There is the idea of, of, of conquest uh, by, by Muslim countries. There's conquest by Christian countries. Uh, and it's happened throughout history. And this is why now we're coming at a point, an inflection point, and in where history takes us for the future. I'm joined now by Doron Alvital. He is the minister of Knesset, former minister of Knesset, the former special commander, uh, special forces commander for the IDF, and he joins us me now. Joins me now from Israel. Thanks so much, Doron, for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. 
Doran, over the course of several months, we've talked about what the IDF has done in terms of what's in terms of its uh, uh, counterattack uh, against Hamas in Gaza. Now, on October the seventh, if you, you and I, I remember distinctly, at the end, middle of October, when Hamas came into uh, came into southern Israel, uh, this was done at a time when the IDF. This was a holiday, if I remember correctly. This was a holiday. This was mm-hmm. when things were quiet. Um, there are a lot who criticize and say that the IDF was was caught off guard. Do you subscribe to that? No, for sure. This was a terrible intelligence failure, but also a terrible operational failure because the troops were not there. There were a few tanks in the front, not prepared. The people in the outpost were not prepared. The, the helicopters came like uh, late and couldn't really figure out who is who. Uh, this was a terrible setback, a terrible failure, the worst failure in the history of the Israeli state and IDF for sure, worse than the Yom Kippur War, which was also a surprise, where we were surprised the uh, civilian. We considered this something that cannot be repeated. This was repeated in a magnitude unheard of and, of course, hitting our citizen. This is something that we didn't feel is part of the script of the future. Now, Duran, I remember this distinctly that day on October the 7th when the first alert came in. First of all, I remember being woken up at 6.30 in the morning by the sirens, by the air raid sirens in Tel Aviv. And I remember distinctly saying, wait, why? What's happened? Something's happened. We, I thought we had a ceasefire. Why are we getting air raid sirens? And after the air raid sirens went away, you would go through the phone and you would see videos being published on, on Telegram and WhatsApp of, of horrific scenes. And I think... Um, it was Israel with the IDF, it was Israel, the leadership in Israel caught off guard in the sense of seeing this video saying, wait, this can't actually be happening. I think in the first few seconds and even in the first few hours, nobody could have imagined the magnitude. And in some sense, the chain of command didn't have the full picture. In some sense, people that had those uh, phones, <laughs> those WhatsApp uh, social media were much more aware. And much of the reaction in the first few hours and during the day was in some sense... People, soldiers, officers, getting their act together, running to the... It wasn't organized by no means. A decision, one of the greatest decisions that was made was the head of the paratroopers brigade, had his brigade in the Dead Sea, my nephew was serving, and he was calling the head of the helicopter squad room and said, listen, come, I bring you up to the, to the scene. A decision made by those two colonels, nobody told them to do so, and this is how some of the paratroopers, this brigade entered... And one helicopter was shot down. Luckily, nobody got hurt and participated in the next in the few hours in Beiri, in Alumim, in all those places. So it was completely a complete mess. And it took us two days or more to get our act together and really clean the area. But does that mean that the IDF does not have a book in the back of the room that says in the event something big like this happens, here's the here's. I mean, it almost in, in America, we have something like DEFCON 5, right? And when, and when you go yeah. to DEFCON 4, you go to DEFCON 3, they're yeah. operational books. Is this to say yeah. that the IDF didn't have that? No. No, sure, they had the books, but I think uh, a few processes really led us to this catastrophe. First of all, our attention was not in the Gaza. We were really taken by the, the image or the vision that Hamas, Hamas now is the ruler of Gaza. He wants to go civil. He wants to take care of the civilian affairs. The Islamic Jihad plays the, the rough kid in the neighborhood. We have to target him, but not Hamas. We really were taken by this vision, and our mind was somewhere else. Our mind was for many years. And this is something that we can argue about, whether it was smart, about Iran, nuclear Iran, preventing the nuclear deal, which it's not clear was a, was a good move by Israel or by Trump. And then Lebanon, Hezbollah, which was the enemy that we really feared from, or we understood that he has a capacity that can really threaten us. So we were very in the north. It could not have happened in this magnitude. And then we had the West Bank. And the year, the year that led to this event, the West Bank was on a constant, there was a constant mini war. The special forces were operating in northern Samaria, Jenin, Tulkarem, Nablus. So the whole attention was somewhere else. We felt uh, Gaza was not in the book. And this is what happens when things like this happen. So they are, you have the operational book, but we don't have the forces, you don't have the alertness of the people, and then everything collapsed. In some ways, that's sort of the, the, it's something that, that Hamas afterwards uh, gloated about, the fact that they yeah. got Israel when uh, uh, basically cut the Achilles heel on October yeah. the 7th. Um, yeah. So what in the in the hours that soon afterwards happened, I remember distinctly that there was a 
because it was Shabbat, it was on a Saturday and Sabbath, and mm. it was a holiday. It was Simchat Torah, yeah. which was uh, uh, another holiday. Um, that that a lot of the people were sort of like they didn't they weren't on their phones. No one understood what was mm-hmm. happening, and it wasn't an alert of like, guys, this is big. This is almost yeah. like you make mention of the Yom Kippur War fifty years before that. Exactly, it took some time to get the magnitude. I mean, I think before before the event started during the night, there were some signals, some awareness, but the, the decision makers didn't really understood what's going on. Sending minimal troops, some uh, of the of the Shabak, of the internal security forces, but nothing of magnitude. But then in the hours that led during this terrible day, then you started getting the magnitude. And when we saw pictures of Hamas uh, on their trucks. Uh, uh, taking the police station of Zderot, which in some sense is the capital of this uh, of this area. I'm thinking I was calling, for example, Amir Peretz, who was the Minister of Defense in, from the Labour Party, and he was locked in his house. I was calling him at 12. The Minister of Defense of Israel, ex-Minister of Defense, locked in his house, uh, afraid of them barging in. This is really unheard of, and I think they even had plans to abduct him. There were rumors going on through the day that he might have been abducted. No, it was a shock, and I think only towards the afternoon we got the magnitude, and uh, yeah, and uh, even the forces that came, for example, the Bayri, they have to get their act together to get what's the story, what forces to employ. It wasn't organized. It took some time, a lot of bravery, but uh, not an organized campaign. Where do you think, I mean, there'll be months or years from now when they do the investigations to yeah. what happened. Where where will they point first? Will they point first to human intelligence failure or will they point to operational failure? I think first of all, human intelligence failure. The fact that it wasn't in the script, though, uh, though there were scripts actually a year before, two years before, uh, documenting in the intelligence force of this possibility of an attack in this magnitude, but it was never taken seriously. It was really something that you have to learn in military is never to undermine your enemy and its capabilities. And I think there was a complete undermining of Hamas capabilities. They were thinking, and we got to this routine, they shoot those missiles, we have the Iron Dome, we are well protected. The Iron Dome is really... Uh, by the way, this Amir Peretz was the guy who was pushing the, the Iron Dome, and then they were up to get him. So uh, all those years we got to this logic that for a year or two we have this operation, small scale operation, they shoot, we shoot back, and then we go back to some deterrence mode. But we were there really carefully, and I think smartly we have to admit, uh, took us by surprise. They planned it. It's not like something, even them themselves in Hamas, only a a minimal uh, decision makers knew exactly what the plans and where are the plans. So they really planned it carefully and they succeeded to to fool us. So first of all, an intelligence failure for sure. Oh, yeah, and but then, you, of course, you have to, right operational as well. So let's talk a little bit about the human. And intelligence then I would part. say I would just okay. add one more thing. Also, some kind of I would say mega strategic or political uh, vision of the Middle East, a way to address the Middle East. And this would be the next stage uh, in terms of whether the direction that Bibi Netanyahu took for the last 15 years was the right direction. So, okay, well, we'll have, we'll talk about that as well in, in a few minutes, but let's go back a little bit about the human intelligence aspect of it, because there were thousands of people who participated in this action. There were freelance journalists who were videotaping and sending it back. So some, they knew yeah. something was up on that day. Yeah, so the yeah. question is, how does how did Israel or was Israel more arrogance? Really, not the right word for it, but maybe it's a little bit of arrogance saying because I remember weeks beforehand there were videos that Hamas were put out saying, "Oh, look at us preparing. Look at us." And moments yeah. from now, we'll 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 attack Israel. And it was a, a belief by Israeli politicians, Israeli media, Israeli civilians. They can't really do this. I mean, they don't have the uh, capability of doing this. I think I think arrogance, hubris. It's always at the core of great failures. When you undermine your enemy, when you don't think they are capable of pulling such a, a trick, when you feel you are in command, and you should see, you should hear our generals in the years before and our politicians, the way they talk down on Hamas. So this was a terrible mistake. It happened to us also with the in 73 with uh, the Egyptian. We had this vision of 67, the Egyptian soldiers fleeing in their masses in the, the Sinai, and we thought those, I would say, uh, Rudy, those Arabs, they can't really pull up a campaign. And then they surprised us with a very orchestrated, well-orchestrated campaign, and also operational failure in 73 in terms of the missile. They used the anti-tank missile and the anti-aeroplane missile. So the same thing happened here. We were also relying very heavily on our defense mechanisms. So first of all, we had the Iron Dome. 
And this really put us a little bit to sleep because the Iron Dome really is dramatically, is magnificent in terms of its capabilities. I remember going with my son in 2014, there was the sirens and he was in the sea surfing and he came out and the mother was insanely frightened and said, well, the Iron Dome computed it, it would fall in the sea, don't worry. So we had a lot of confidence in terms of the Iron Dome. Then we were worried of those tunnels, but we all the time felt, felt and thought about the tunnels as attack tunnels. So we, once we did this barrier and we invested like a few billion of Israeli shekels and we actually celebrated this event of uh, building this, uh, this uh, barrier, an uh, underground barrier, we felt we are protected. And then we had all the mechanism on the fences and the technology and, and we felt this is it. This is airtight. Nobody can surprise us. We are set. The only thing is when to, if they, if they shoot their missiles, when to attack back. So this would be, uh, but this is the lesson of every, every story and military story will tell you, whenever you think you have an airtight defense mechanism and a passive defense mechanism, then you'll find out a script in the future that would undermine the whole uh, conception of your defense. So defense has to be a little bit, as we say, on the offensive, when you are more engaged. I would mention that in 2018, there was a very secretive, but then not secretive operation of the IDF, of the special forces in Gaza. It was uh, discovered by Hamas and we succeeded to rescue the troops. And I think it's also added up to the feeling that we don't want to take too many risks, but you have to take risks in order to avoid a big risk. And this is where the our mistake. And has that had to do with, with financial? I mean, the fact that you have so much uh, resources put into the IDF that at some point the government says, wait a minute, maybe we're spending too much money. We need to pull back. Things seem to be calm. And I use that term in quotations. And therefore, let's redirect our forces financially, um, because otherwise you become a military state. Yeah, of course, of course. There was for the last 20 years a few vision for the Israeli army. The the downsizing of the army, because we felt the big wars, the wars of tanks running in the Sinai and the Golan Heights, those are behind us. So this is asymmetrical wars. We fight against terrorists. It's mainly special forces and air force and intelligence and closing the loop between intelligence, air force and special forces. And this is why we downsized the army. And we felt even the tanks to be a tank brigade commander didn't was not considered like a... Uh, something that uh, um, that kids aspire to. Kids want to be in the special forces. They want to be in those uh, unique uh, units. But then, of course, uh, this led us to those. This this led to, in many respects, to to uh, to the surprise. Also, we had many fronts. You mentioned the West Bank. The West Bank is a constant engagement. Then a lot of attention, as I said, was directing the secretive operation Iran. So the whole attention also of the army, not only of the Mossad and so on, was towards Iran. Uh, Lebanon, we withdrew with Lebanon. We felt that we have some deterrence equation with Hezbollah. Uh, Syria was not an enemy anymore because after the civil war, Syria collapsed. So there was a sense, I was attending, uh, I remember once attending a discussion in which one of the guys said, our security situation was never better. And I was a little bit in shock. I remember this like a year, a year and a half before those events. So we were completely confident that the times of the big wars are behind us. There would be those incursions, those engagements. We have to work out the startup nation vision for the country. We have the technology, we have the means, we are protected, we have the Iron Dome. Let's go forward. And this vision collapsed on the 7th of October. So weeks later, about three weeks later, after the forces were amassed along the border with Gaza, the IDF incurred into Gaza, starting at the top, starting at the north and working their way down as a special command, as special forces commander. What instructions are are is a platoon given when they go in? Are they, they explain because a lot of the people here in America have not served in the military, so they don't understand what the chain of command is. How does that work? Okay, so I can compare it to the Lebanon War of 82. I was a company commander back then. But then, back then, we planned the war a half a year ahead of time. There was not clear there would be a war. We were planning. We had different uh, missions. For example, I was supposed to be landing from the sea north of uh, Tzor in, in the Lebanon. Then I, I landed north of Sidon. So plans can change. But every the main thing you do, you assign missions. The, uh, the forces practice to this mission. This way, the army there wasn't even rushing. We had three weeks to prepare, okay? And you have to have the big grand plan. In retrospect, it's not clear whether they're going from the north and slowly Gaza Strip to the south. But this is retrospect was the smartest move because we saw that Khan Yunus was the hub. And if we could, we could as we did in previous operation, cut Gaza in two, north and south, and operate uh, simultaneously. 
uh, then it might our condition might have been better and we might have locked also the the leaders of Hamas and also locked uh, some of our hostages that were all the time transported to the south so but then uh, then we have to understand that after those three weeks the uh, the sense of confidence had to come back to the army there were even generals ex generals a famous general uh, brick from the Yom Kippur war an elderly general that was warning us and went to meet Bibi and said, don't enter, it's going to be a trap, it's going to be a catastrophe. And I think the, the estimation in terms of our losses in the beginning were much worse than we incurred in the in the days that followed. So mm -hmm. you you assign the forces, a heavy force, in the, say a brigadier general, he has his tanks, he has an engineering corps. The engineering dimension of this war was dramatic because of the infrastructure of tunnel and this is i think the second shock intelligence wise wise we had we never imagined such an infrastructure of tunnel so it's not only fighting in urban warfare which is hard as it is and i know it from beirut that there's a new dimension to the war and this is the uh, set of tunnels in which everybody can surprise you where the enemy hides and you can't hit it you don't want to enter you use technology robotics then you uh, to enter even this is a so it adds up to the, the to the complexity of the, the right i mean let our viewers know we should let our viewers know that that there are estimates now that there are about 450 miles worth of tunnels underneath gaza now just to put it in perspective there's uh, the new york city subway system is 250 miles so if, if you're basically building twice the size of the new york city subway system underneath a, a, a city or an area that's one fourth the size of New York City. I mean, just imagine this second level city yeah. that's that becomes another another ground warfare underneath. Exactly. This was I think this was maybe upon entering. This was our greatest uh, shock. Also, in terms of our attempt, we really were hoping the special forces adding to the forces would succeed to locate our hostages, rescue them on the ground, on the spot. Uh, but then we understood that there's a way of channeling leaders and uh, ammunition and terrorists and hostages down to the south. And uh, this is where we started focusing after the north, focusing on Khan Yunus. We are still fighting in Khan Yunus, deepening our hold in Khan Yunus. And trying to dismantle the whole infrastructure of the, those tunnels, because whatever we'll do in 2024, we'll, have, we'll keep being some kind of uh, war in Gaza, entering in and out. We don't want them to have this dimension in which they can surprise us. So we have to dismantle the whole infrastructure. Do you feel it was a, it was a, a missed opportunity to wait three weeks or four weeks before entering Gaza? Should it have been done that day one? Or uh, I mean, there was some. There was some uh, air bombing of, of Gaza at the, on yeah. the first few weeks, but yeah. not a surge like we would know about it in American yeah. technology. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. I mean, uh, I think we were not prepared for, I mean, the shock was too much. The blow was too much. We had to reorganize. We had to take three days even to make sure that the land, are, that our area is uh, protected and clear and clean from terrorists. So I think it took some time. I, I wouldn't rush. There were even were. I mean, because Hezbollah also joined the joined the uh, the war, and they were like uh, they were even in the war cabinet. I think even Gallant, the minister of defense, he was thinking maybe we should attack simultaneously in uh, Hezbollah, as if take the opportunity. But I think when you are caught when you are getting caught off guard in such a fashion, uh, wait, prepare your forces, be prepared. You don't want to after such a failure to have another failure. And it's it was a wise step. I think Americans help us helped us in uh, this uh, way not to go to Lebanon and just continue this exchange with the Hezbollah, but not enter Lebanon and concentrate on uh, the south on Gaza and prepare our forces. And it takes three weeks. I mean, I'm telling you, Lebanon war, we prepared for half a year in some way or another. So three weeks to organize the forces, to decide who commands what, and to have the plans, have them open the map, see that the technology is in place, see that the, the loop between Air Force intelligence and forces on the ground works. You don't want people to shoot at each other. It's also complicated, and we had soldiers killed in those uh, exchanges right. between. So it's a, comp a complicated um, battlefield, and I think it was smart to wait. The only thing in retrospect, that only in retrospect, Perhaps we could have like cut Gaza into a network from the north down and maybe blocked Hamas from channeling his forces and hostages down to the south. There is a, a body of, of uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but whether it's social media, whether it's uh, public opinion, 
that felt that the uh, the the bombing of Gaza was uh, it's too much to see that there's the pictures of, of Gaza City and rubble the the city that yeah. you see pictures of of the, the of, of yeah. a lot of Gaza City being destroyed of Khan Yunus being destroyed it's too much uh, how do you counter that from an Israeli perspective that that this is the way that has to get done. Okay. Well, I mean, this is not, it's a tough question. And maybe in retrospect, when we will investigate exactly the moves of the army, we can understand. First of all, in terms of ratio of uh, Hamas terrorists getting killed and civilians, I don't know yet the ratio. Because in urban warfare, in every war, you take Iraq, the civilian casualties, and we have to weigh the, uh, the ratio. There's no question that Hamas infrastructure was underneath civilian uh, structure. It can be a mosque, can be a hospital, it can be a kindergarten. So there's no question that they've been using the civilian uh, facade of places in order to operate from, and our soldiers saw it. So this added uh, a serious complexity. Of course, you have to be very major in using the fire uh, in this context, in civilian context. The outcome is tragic. I hope in the end we can say that in, the con in comparison to other battlefields, this is a radio that I wouldn't say satisfac satisfactory because satisfactory is not the right word for civilians dead, but that there was no way to avoid this kind of casualties. And you have also to understand that Hamas, it's true that Hamas, you talk about the warriors, the terrorists, but Hamas has margin. They are like a policeman that was using weapons, a, a, a policeman of Hamas. Hamas is a, was ruling Gaza. And you can find in a hospital that some of the staff is, uh, we found in Uran, some of the staff were really actually participating in the 7th of October. So it's a complicated animal, Hamas, and it go, penetrates all layers of the uh, Gazan uh, society. It's not a very clear cut civilians in Gazan. And soldiers in the heat of the battlefield, protecting the soldiers, using the Air Force, casualties are unavoidable, unfortunately. So let's talk a little bit about what makes Gaza different than Lebanon. You served in Lebanon in the yeah. 1980s. That, that, like you mentioned, that it took months to put together a plan to go after yeah. Lebanon. So now if it were to increase, if it were to step up, uh, what we're seeing this back, back and forth tit for tat, I mean, there will be a point when Israel will have to yeah. cross into Lebanon, I would imagine, yeah. um, to take it care of it once and for all. Yeah. The question is, what does it mean to take... Lebanon. I mean, the question is whether a, a contained of a campaign in the south of Lebanon is a, can be worked out without us engaging in without having in the end being forced to engage in a full blown war. I want to remind the, our audience that in seventy eight, four years before the Lebanon War of eighty two, this is history. But in seventy eight, the PLO was holding southern Lebanon in the same way that Hezbollah is holding with camps, with uh, weaponry, with uh, in a regiment structure, the same way Hezbollah did. And in 78, there was a, a limited content operation, the Litani operation, it was called, after a horrific terror attack uh, on the, near Tel Aviv, a bit north of Tel Aviv, in which we actually, we have not a lot of, uh, I mean, I think uh, 30 or 40 soldiers got killed, unfortunately, but we succeeded to actually create a buffer zone, a security zone all the way to the Litani, and it really helped us for many years. I mean, uh, and then in the end, we left the buffer zone only in 2000, the decision of Ehud Barak. And we had Sadal, the, the, the southern Lebanese army that was participating with us in commanding this buffer zone. So Israel would have liked to have a buffer zone, but this buffer zone could have achieved and we would have liked it to be achieved through some uh, decision. There was the UN decision of the war of Lebanon in 2006, the 1701. That meant that Hezbollah operative cannot cross the Litani uh, the Litani River, this is the canyon that really separates the, the southern Lebanon with the rest of Lebanon. And of course, they, uh, they, they, they didn't obey by it, and not the UN and not the Lebanese uh, army, which is very weak, could uh, prevent them from doing it. So the question is whether we can push them back, because we have to bring our citizens back. This is our main uh, concern right now. Right. Uh, just so our viewers understand, there's about a, uh, tens of thousands of Israeli citizens who have been uh, who have been told to evacuate the area about five or six kilometers south of the border of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, what I'm asking here, I, I guess, Daron, is the difference between the urban warfare that occurs in Gaza City and mm -hmm. the area that's in the north of Israel and Lebanon. This is this is wooded area. This is th mm -hmm. these are. This is not a desert oasis kind of area. This is a, this is, I was up in the area maybe six months ago, seven months ago. There are woods, there's streams, there's, it, yeah. it's not as easy. 
It's a different area. It's one of the mo most beautiful countries in the world we ever visited. Lebanon, there's canyons, there's, uh, of course, uh, woods. So you have to plan the, I mean, this is not Gaza. This is not a contained uh, stretch of land near the sea, completely urban, uh, very, without way of maneuvering. Here you have to plan the battlefield more like in classical terms, where the troops move, where do you put your artillery, where do you, how do you, how do you allow to, a tank uh, brigade to move. It has to be planned. And I think right now, our, the advantage that we have in Lebanon right now, that those few months allowed us in the north to engage with Hezbollah. He paid dearly. I mean, 300 of his soldiers got killed and we succeeded to hit some of his uh, cache, weaponry caches. And we also succeeded to hit uh, some of his leaders. And I think also the friction engaging with the enemy gives us right now a, a better understanding if we go to Lebanon of war, how to operate. So I think in Lebanon, we have trained forces. We had those months, they are trained. They know that they work the maps. They know the intelligence. So a Lebanon campaign will be, it should be a different idea if much more prepared. But of course, Hezbollah is a, a very strong enemy in comparison to Hamas in terms of weaponry, missiles. They're going, they can hit Haifa. So the question, I think the main question about Lebanon, whether a contained campaign is possible only in the South, and I think it was Hochstein who said, listen up, a warning to us or to whom I don't know. Listen up, there's no such thing as a contained campaign in Lebanon. You go to a contained campaign in the south of Lebanon, in the end, they shoot Haifa, you shoot Beirut, this is the headquarters, Dachia, the headquarters of there. As we've been targeting Baal Bek, so the back office of Baal Bek is in the Lebanese Baka, 100 kilometers away. This is like the, the, the logistics backup, if you want, or their back office. So we've been hitting there lately. We have to still see how they would retaliate for, for it, uh, to this uh, action of ours. And the question is whether in the end we go to a campaign or some diplomatic way out, I'm not sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the idea of, uh, in a few moments that we have left, in terms of the technology that's being used. I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier in our, in our broadcast today about the startup nation, the idea that there was there's this tech group, this tech yeah. uh, hub that Israel has become. So much, and it, this goes back to the idea of the ratio of civilians versus combatants. I mean, the, yeah. the numbers that I saw, this comes from John Spencer, who is the, probably the urban warfare expert out of, out of West Point, out of the United States, yeah. who says that in Gaza, it's been 1.5 combatants, uh, 1.5 civilians per one combatant that's killed. Now, the, what, that may sound like a terrible number, that it's one for one, but if in normal warfare, it's nine civilians yeah, yeah. to one combatant or 10. Com yeah. in, in fact, in World War II, it's upwards of 15, 20. Yeah. So the fact that it's down to 1.5 to one, and it's terrible. Every life loss is a yeah, terrible yeah. thing. Um, but it's also being the idea that the IDF has done, to, done this by using technology. There is the Iron Dome is a good example. This was a technology that basically uses trigonometry, basic trigonometry, yeah. trigonometry yeah. to figure out where... Uh, missiles are headed. Um, then now there's something called gospel, which is uh, which was brought out by uh, by uh, by some journalists in Israel, which is basically an AI program that helps identify targets uh, and minimize civilian casualties. Is this is this moment a moment for Israel where, like it was in World War II for the United States, when we developed here in the United States, we developed the space program and we developed everything from the, from World War II. Is this the moment yeah. for Israel as well? Yeah, I think in many respects it is, but not only for Israel. We're entering a new landscape of war when you think of drones, when you think of robotics, when you think of AI. But I want to make sure to make to emphasize one point, even if AI is deployed, like it was described in with this platform, the decision to drop the bomb is always a human decision. I mean, the AI can bring back the targets, and many in the, in the battlefield, uh, many will decide that uh, a lower rank officer can qualify a target and can say, go for it, because you have many targets and you're in war and people are in danger and you have to uh, you have to help them to maneuver. So maybe a lower rank officer would be in a position and decision making position to say, this is a target, this is a target and can be hit. But it's not automated in a fashion which it doesn't involve a human decision. So AI, it's really a machinery uh, platform, of course, like in every other domain, it can help us facilitate and uh, bring the targets up to the decision makers, and then they have to make a decision. There's no such thing, and we have to be uh, aware, there's no such thing as a, a sort of automatic loop which the machine identify a target. And uh, I don't think, I hope the battlefield doesn't go this fashion, not only in Israel, but in general in the world, 
because with no decision makers in the battlefield, we can have catastrophes and we have to use very smartly those AI platforms. But I think the whole landscape of war is changing rapidly before our eyes in terms of the precision of the weaponry. Uh, I think when we were fighting in Lebanon, we had no vest because we didn't think we are fighting against snipers that have precision mechanisms that are un unmatched or that you can be hit by a drone from the top, the way we see in Ukraine, in the Ukraine battlefield. So this is a whole new battlefield with many dimensions, aerial dimension, precision guided uh, tools, missiles, anti-tank missiles that don't need a site, a, a line of sight that can go there, like optic mechanism of finding their targets. And AI can be a sort of a cogwheel, an important cogwheel in those systems. But in the end, you need to have a decision making and you have to make sure that there is a decision making uh, human because otherwise whoa, it would be a catastrophe, um, not a place to be in, I would say. I imagine so. And the final subject I want to get to, Doron, with you today is, is to talk about the documentation of the IDF. But everything is documented. I found it fascinating when I was speaking with some IDF soldiers, uh, off off duty soldiers who told me, Everything that they do is documented and it's done for a reason. And I, I describe first why is it documented and why? W what's the idea? Okay. First of all, the Army has a very good culture of uh, briefing and debriefing after every operation. And this is very important. It has to be honest, and the investigation has to be clear because commander has to come up front. This is also a problem because if you if you flood the system with a if you want a, a legal fear. That the, that the commander wouldn't come up front and say what it, what are the decisions that he made because he's afraid of some legal uh, punishment in the end, then you don't have this kind of uh, transparent environment that you need in order to draw the lesson for the future. Because there are terrible mistakes made here. It's all, the mistakes are all in terms of also the procedure, the te technology that we're using, but also we have to identify who are the commanders who are less capable because an army in the end works on the talent of the commander. And in every man, I, you know, in times of no war, sometimes the mediocre talent comes up because they're more bureaucratic, more organized, and the talent is vanished, is leaving the army. And right now, we have to identify who proved itself himself in the battlefield as the talent that we need to promote in order to create a new army, which will be of a bigger in size. We have to uh, we have to go against the tendency of downsizing the army, uh, more equipped to the new landscape of war. Uh, this would be quite a challenge, and adding the political havoc, the question of drafting the orthodox, this would be a big, uh, a tall order for the Israeli generals and the Israeli politicians in in the time. But even more so, even time. more so, Doron, if I may, I think even more so, the issue here has to do with, I, if I remember correctly from what my, my the, the people I've interviewed, is that they said that every single bomb that's dropped, we know what angle, we know why it was done that way. Yeah, for sure. It's to prevent, it's to prevent later on to be used against them in the International Court of Justice in The Hague, for in sure. different... For and sure. that's what I want to get at, Doron, is that okay. why is it documented? For what reason? Is it the it, it, as, a, as, a, as proof? I don't... I think it comes from the operational mindset. I mean, you don't uh, document every shot that a, a paratrooper soldier in Gaza shoots. But you cannot. But in those major decisions, when somebody decides that there's a target and the target is being hit and the airplane goes up in there, the Air Force is very uh, transparent in this way because it's also a technological uh, uh, discipline. So it, first of all, it comes from operational lesson, but of course it can it can uh, support us in the, the, the decision that when we'll, when we'll be questioned in the future about some of the decision, we can present the case in the most documented manner. And this is important. I think every army in the world that was visiting once a few years ago, the Czech army that works with the U.S. and and the main guy in the, the special forces unit was a lawyer, and he told me he told me that the law the, the the law has to go with the with the soldiers because you have to be also protect the soldiers in terms of the decision they make. They make tough calls in tough circumstances, and then to judge them out of the context in which those decisions were made. This is not only impolite to the soldier; it might prevent commander and the soldier to to serve to make good decision in the future. So you have to give them this legal uh, backup. This is key. Otherwise they would do, they would back up of their duties and responsibility before the soldiers and the, con the military context in which they are in. This is very important. Yes. Right, because, and, and one point, the final point I'll make is that it has to do with the, if you remember uh, very recently, there was a, there was an incident that occurred with the aid trucks coming in and they were being, the IDF was exactly. being attacked by the people on this, uh, there in Rafa. 
Uh, there was gunfire. The IDF claims that the, they were shooting warning shots. And at the point when they felt threatened, they did shoot, but not to the extent where hundreds were killed, as was claimed by Hamas. And now they're looking at body cam footage to see where that goes. Uh, is that is that typical of a, the new IDF commanders that they have to look at these kind of things when it comes to body cam footage, uh, aerial footage, drone footage? I, I think for sure, for sure, in the context of fighting a civilian's warfare, where also the civilians or our enemy, for that matter, is trying to use or exploit incidents like this in order to put the blame on us. You remember the issue of the misfire, the missile of the jihad, Islamic Jihad that, was, that fell on a hospital in the beginning. But we have, and this is, I think, the, the current spokesman of the IDF is doing it very well, be very credible. If we have the facts, we give the fact clear cut, even if we have to wait, because if we miss and we're trying to uh, beautify the facts and order to bring them in uh, as they are, then in the end we will fail. And I think it's very important for an army. Remember that the armies of uh, the six days where we were, as a kid, we were mocking the armies of the Arab countries because they would mystify those stories. And we knew the only credible evidence is what the IDF says. So we are an organized army and we have to be very clear that our whatever we say is credible, checked, overchecked, and then can be presented to the world and to the public. Donal Vital, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Donal Vital is a Pleasure. former special commander, special forces commander for the IDF. Yeah. He's also a former uh, minister of the Knesset. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for joining us thank this, you. this afternoon Albert, here. It was a pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. And on the, on the next episode of 2A, we'll talk a lot about what the this what this war means uh, in terms of trauma, in terms of helping those uh, in the war uh, deal with what happens afterwards. I'm Albert Lewitchin reporting. Thanks for joining us.